Hello friends, or maybe I should say greetings all who breathe the fresh air of liberty. I'm Thomas Waters and welcome to my video series on revolutions and the making of the modern world. This series is about the history of revolutions over the past two and a half centuries. Today I'd like to talk to you about a very special revolutionary moment, a vintage year of revolt in fact. That year is 1848 when revolutionary waves crashed over Europe cowing and in some cases sweeping away ministries, governments and monarchies throughout the entire continent. The first victim was King Ferdinand II of the Two Sicilies as his dual kingdom of Naples and Sicily was known. Sicily had been smouldering in rebellion for months and occasionally breaking out into open fires of revolt. Yet a step change occurred early in January 1848, following the authorities' rather ill-chosen decision to close the university. Deprived of their studies, unoccupied young and educated revolutionaries began fanning out across the capital city of Palermo, plastering manifestos on walls and pushing them into their compatriots' hands. To arms, sons of Sicily, these manifestos read with a typical revolutionary combination of sacrifice, idealism and courage. Critics might also say that they expressed unrealistic expectations, if not utopianism and outright delusion. The force of the people is omnipotent. The unity of the people will bring the fall of the king the day of 12th January 1848 at dawn will bring the glorious epoch of universal regeneration, they read. Barricades went up, insurgents mustered, peasants began occupying and seizing land. Within weeks, the government had been dislodged and newly formed revolutionary committees were taking charge across the island. By February, revolution had spread to France. After a few days of street fighting, King Louis-Philippe leapt off his throne and fled to England. Word of his toppling travelled fast in the new mid-19th century era of railways and steam-driven newspaper printing. By the 29th of February, the news had reached Vienna, capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It inspired demonstrations, risings and confrontations, which by March had brought down Chancellor Metternich, the great architect of the post-Napoleonic European settlement. Barricades went up in Milan, Venice and Prague too, across the constituent states of the German Federation, from Prussia in the east to Frankfurt in the west. Revolutionaries took to the streets to confront the forces of order amid cries of Einheit und Freiheit, unity and freedom. Initially successful revolts took place in Wallachia, in what is today part of Romania, and in Hungary, while smaller though quickly put down risings also broke out in Ireland and in Moldavia in Central and Eastern Europe. For the people who lived through it, 1848 felt special, extraordinary and unprecedented. No wonder. An entire continent formed of distinct nations, nationalities, political factions and social groups had been deluged by a succession of independent yet related revolutions. Contemporaries spoke of the year of revolutions, one that had not a parallel in any former year of the modern world, as one British newspaper put it. We have been living amidst the birth throes of a great epoch, read the Manchester Times. If democracy is not established, despotism at least has fallen. 1848 felt special at the time, but it's been less often recognised as such since. Mostly I suppose that's because the forces of order soon coalesced, reorganised and regained power, though in the case of Austria-Hungary this was in conjunction with foreign military might supplied by the arch-conservative and reactionary power that was the Russian Empire's Tsarist autocracy. By 1849, revolutionary regimes and many of their key gains had been removed. France's workshop scheme of urban public employment was soon disbanded amid more street fighting, not least because the taxes to fund it had been levied on an unwilling and resentful peasantry of rural smallholders. In 1851, on the anniversary of the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon Bonaparte's nephew and the President of the Second Republic, Napoleon III, staged a coup d'etat that eventually re-established the French Empire. At the very least, though, France never returned to monarchy, constitutional or otherwise. In the German states, revolutionary dreams of national unification had to wait until the 1870s. 
was a stable system of liberal and constitutional politics would take much longer still. Great landowners and Junkers remained a potent force, particularly in Prussia. Yet if nothing else, the 1848 revolutions did at least permanently abolish serfdom and improve the lot of rural workers and peasants in German and Austrian lands. These limited long-term results probably account for some of the subsequent underplaying of the 1848 revolutions. To take one example, in the distinguished historical sociologist Charles Tilley's general overview of the history of European revolutions between 1492 and 1992, the revolutions of 1848 don't even receive two pages. Actually, they barely get two paragraphs. Of course, there are plenty of specialist books and articles about 1848 and the numerous constituent revolutions out of which it was formed. But in the general and theoretical literature of revolts and revolutions, this great revolutionary year, and maybe even the greatest ever revolutionary year, gets vastly less attention than, for example, the English Civil War, the late 18th century French Revolution, the 1917 Russian Revolutions, or the Chinese Communist Revolution. I think this is unfortunate. 1848 has much to teach us about the nature of revolutions that we can't easily appreciate or learn from studying those other great revolutions in isolation. This is because the 1848 revolutions present an especially rich opportunity for comparative history, with different revolutions breaking out at the same time. We really should be able to employ them to formulate and test hypotheses and theories about the nature and causality of revolutions. The first lesson of 1848 is, I think, that revolutions are powered by momentum. The convictions and thinking behind them, the revolutionary mindset, if you will, is deeply emotional rather than coldly calculating, and also highly social. Inspiration is contagious. Courage spreads, disseminates and multiplies. These feelings of being part of a general revolutionary moment are at least as important as the distinctive grievances and social conditions that inspire dissent in a particular society. Hence why so many extraordinarily different revolutionaries were able to successfully spark and inspire each other. Students and peasants in Sicily, Republicans, advocates of civil liberties, radicals and urban working people in France, nobles and intellectuals in Moldavia. 1848, in other words, found nationalists, peasants, communists, anarchists, socialists, intellectuals, nobles and others taking part in the same revolutionary moment. We might infer from this extremely diverse and disparate body of revolutionaries that, during the outbreak of revolutions at least, momentum and the spirit of the moment are more important than ideology and finely honed political creeds. We might also conclude that fear, hopelessness and the inclination to surrender are also contagious. This may explain why so many different regimes, from constitutional monarchies to autocracies and empires, were cowed, initially at least, by the 1848 revolutionaries. A second related lesson of 1848 is of the centrality of technologies of communication in the early stages of revolution. The 1848 revolts were newspaper revolutions above all. It was when the newspapers arrived, bringing news that monarchs and ministers presiding over neighbouring states had fallen, that local ferment began. A third lesson is that revolutions are always international rather than national events, which have serious implications for nearby states. Finally, at risk of ending on what some will find a depressing and dispiriting note, I'd like to raise the possibility that contagious, wave-like revolutions, amazing and overwhelming as they seem at the outset, are among the less secure and permanent political revolts. The revolutions of 1848 seem to sweep all before them, yet note how easily and quickly many of their gains and concessions were rolled back. The changes, perhaps because they were so rapidly and easily won, did not run deep. To some extent, we might draw parallels with the Arab Spring of the early 2010s. Constitutional government was, it's true, won in Tunisia, yet elsewhere, and even in Egypt where the world watched the amazing occupation of Tahrir Square, the results of what at the time was an inspiring revolutionary wave look in retrospect pretty modest. Revolutionary waves like 1848 and the Arab Spring, in other words, tell us a lot about how revolutions break out. 
but they reveal a lot less about how revolutions can bring about permanent and fundamental change.